welcome to Worth Live. Thank you all for joining this week's Next Normal series on the psychological toll of COVID and how our children can succeed despite isolation in partnership with Kathy Entwistle, Private Wealth Advisor at Morgan Stanley and 1800 Flowers. Firstly, I hope you and your loved ones are keeping well during what has and continues to be a challenging time for so many people. I'm Juliet Scott Croxford, CEO at Worth Media, and I'm thrilled to be joined by our special guest today, Dr. Chloe Carmichael, licensed clinical psychologist, Kathleen Entwistle, Managing Director and Private Wealth Advisor at Morgan Stanley Private Wealth Management, Carol Stern, Executive Director at Walton Family Foundation, and Daniel Willingham, Professor of Psychology and Director of Graduate Studies at University of Virginia. We're also delighted to be joined by co-host Jim McCann, who's founder and chair of 1-800-Flowers and chair at Worth Media. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. How are you? Terrific. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Molly, our producer picked that nice opening music, and uh, a wise, uh, a wise uh, member of the uh, marketing community told me one time, music is so important because it tells you how to feel, and that's a great way to make us all feel. Thank you, Molly. Yeah, thank you, Molly. Um, as many of you know, our intention at Worth is to create conversations that help inspire and inform our community, many of whom are investors, entrepreneurs, and business leaders who want to leave a positive impact on the world and help to create a more inclusive and equal society and economy for the benefit of everyone. And we call that Worth Beyond Wealth. So we hope you enjoy this session and we hope you find it valuable. Forward thinking has really been the essence of this series since we started it in March, uh, and we called it The Next Normal, where Worth has been looking ahead to what the world looks like in this new environment that we're now living in. It goes without saying that the pandemic has taken a toll on everyone, but most affected is our children, and, and we've, we've suffered through, that they have suffered through disruptions in how they learn, how they build relationships. Um, they have been isolated from extended family, friends, classmates, extracurricular activities, holiday traditions, and they're among the most affected and the most important investment because they represent our future. And no people of all ages are, are facing mental health challenges right now. I think children are one of the most vulnerable communities because of the long-term sociological and, and psychological challenges they face. So we felt this was a really important topic to cover on this series. And, and we're thrilled to be joined by some terrific experts and thought leaders, uh, Dr. Chloe Carmichael, Kathleen Entwistle, Carol Stern, Daniel Willingham, and Jim McCann, as we explore the importance of human relationships in kids, K-12, the important decisions that we as parents can make and how we can foster a sense of community and achievement and belonging for our children in, in this sort of socially distanced world. A few housekeeping rules before I hand over to Jim to welcome our first guest. Um, you're all familiar with this format by now. Please do set your uh, chat function to all panelists and attendees. We welcome any thoughts or questions from you and we'll be moderating that throughout the session um, and um, we will weave that into the conversation. Um, but uh, sit back, enjoy, um, and I think this is going to be a great discussion. Jim, I'll, we'll hand over to you. Well, you know, uh, I, I guess how this started was an accident like so many things, but one of the things I miss most during this uh, COVID uh, crisis uh, is, uh, is serendipity. What I mean by that is I've been going into our office on Long Island for flowers uh, once or twice a week. And several weeks ago, I was in the office and there were a group of uh, uh, young folks gathered uh, in our merchandising area that I was passing through. And we stopped and had a conversation. And I was telling them about you, Dr. Dan. I was telling them about how I read this terrific article you wrote in the, uh, the op-ed section of the Washington Post back in September and how I was blown away by the by the insight and the practical uh, suggestions you had in that piece. And I, and I told them I wrote you a fan letter saying how wonderful the piece was and how at that time I was not seeing enough about the impact of COVID on kids. And uh, so the conversation, these are all young parents and they're talking about how tough it is with school, it's in, it's out, uh, her husband has to work and how, what do they do with the kids? All of a sudden they just got noticed there, there was a positive case, they're out of school tomorrow. They're not sure about the weekend. Will they go back before? All these questions that young parents are wrestling with. And so I said, well, here's what Dr. Dan was saying about that. 
And one of the uh, young ladies said, geez, I'd love some time to be able to have a conversation with him myself. And so I said, he's such a wonderful guy and to become a new friend, uh, maybe he'd be willing to do that. And so, oh, good. And, and, can, and one of them said, can I invite so-and-so from our Harry and David brand? Because she and I were just having this conversation. And she said, uh, my counterparty, it's Cheryl's Cookies. He was dealing with this. It, could we invite them too? And then finally someone said, well, why don't we open it up to our community? So that's how it, that, that's the serendipity I miss. A, a casual conversation in the hall, recalling your article in the uh, Washington Post, how we've connected and become close now and how uh, there's wonderful information out there, but it's not getting out. And so then when Juliet and I had this conversation, she said, I'd like to bring it to our Worth community. And Kathy said, well, I'd like to be involved. I, I have the same questions. My clients have the same. So that's how this erupted. And I was introduced to Dr. Chloe and Juliet said, well, we have to get Cal involved. She's the expert here. So here we are. And uh, I'll make it as simple. Uh, uh, Carol, your birthday is at the, at the end of October, right before that, my first grandchild's birthday, Abigail just turned 12. And it was beautiful weather Sunday. They live right nearby, we're so lucky. And she's one of three kids my daughter Erin has. And we went over for Abigail's birthday. We had our mask on, we were physically distanced. We were in the backyard, the weather was nice. And I said to Marilyn on the way home, I said, I'm uncomfortable about what the consequences is this will be because the only thing that I can do uh, to threaten my grandkids is tell them, I'm gonna come hug you. Oh, no, no. And I said a simple little thing like that, but what's the longer term effects of this lack of physical intimacy, the, the hugs that I miss? And so I said, I know an expert in this area. So I'm gonna turn to Dr. Dan and say, in addition to what Juliet said about the long-term consequences of education interruptus, social development throughout this, all the real serious consequences. What about grandpa who's worried about, will his kids think differently about their relationship with their grandparents in the future? So I, I, I would be reassured. I would not worry that your kids are gonna feel differently about, uh, about their family members. And broadly speaking, um, you know, this is one little component of your relationship with them. Physical closeness is important, of course, but what we have to think about is ways of replacing that with, um, you know, as best we can with some other type of intimacy. Um, and you mentioned ritual before. I mean, this is something that all of us are feeling so acutely. One of the things that's so upsetting about the pandemic is that the things that we're used to and the ways that we are used to expressing values like closeness of a family, those have gotten disrupted. And so what we need to do is think of new ways of uh, expressing that closeness. Well, your, your primary uh, area of study, uh, Dan, is in, in memory research and you're a real clinician there. And when, when you write, I've seen you write about how we remember things and, it, and there are episodes weaved into story. Yeah. So are you, how are you and your wife being deliberate about shaping those ep episodes that will weave into the narrative of your four girls' lives? It's true. I mean, it, it, uh, as a memory researcher, you do end up with a funny perspective on things sometimes because I frequently think about how I'm going to remember things decades from now. Um, and when it comes to memory, those very long-term memories, um, individual memories of what happens day to day really gets blurred and they get colored by what you remember as what usually happened. So you remember things very much in themes. You don't really remember, like you're, you're in my memory of high school, we may think that it's really accurate, but actually we have this general image of what high school was like, what I was like, what my relationship with my parents was like. And then we're going to pick keeps up. getting better. <laughs> I, well, it's yeah. funny because I said I said something about our memories of high school, and like everyone starts to sort of smile and think back <laughs> on what high school was like, uh, for better or worse, right? Um, the things I've read about Kathy in high school, I can't repeat. Oh, yeah, don't. don't. <laughs> okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll explore that offline in the laboratory, maybe. Um, 
So yeah, so the I'm I'm actually being quite intentional in thinking about building those memories. In other words, when we think back on a period of our life, it's very much colored by our sense of what things were generally like. And so I'm very intentionally thinking how I want my children to remember the pandemic is that was hard, but like I was with my family and things were okay. And so I'm trying to think about how I can build in you know, daily, uh, that sense of safety and that sense of, you know, my family is still my family. Things have changed, uh, but our family values have not changed. The way we relate to one another fundamentally is still the same. Now, what rituals have you invented or reinvented now for your family uh, that have been a byproduct of this, this period? Yeah, so one of them was, especially this, uh, we started thinking about this, my wife and I, early on, when there, everybody, I think, was a little bit half, oh my gosh, and then also half, woe is me. Um, we started um, uh, a version of grace, which we call gratitude, where we go around the table and just for a moment or two, talk about something that we are grateful for. Uh, over the course of the day, just to sort of get out of our own heads about, you know, feeling sorry for ourselves and, and all the things that we're missing out on. Uh, any, another, any devices at dinner? I'm sorry? Any devices allowed at dinner? Oh, no, no. Yeah. Devices are, no, absolutely not. Um, and and uh, after dinner, are there any videos of these living room dance parties? <laughs> There are sometimes videos. Those are uh, like Kathy's high school experiences. Those will remain in the vault. The, uh, the, uh, the, the dance videos are not, not pretty to look at. But, but when you get uh, the family is... to be corny like that together and to laugh and to pierce their comfort zones, those are episodes which will become woven into their memory, no? Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, and this is another ritual that we have is that um, it used to be, you know, after supper, we everybody would sort of go their separate ways and kids maybe had homework and mom and I had things to do. Uh, but we make a point of doing something as a family and each family member goes in rotation over the course of the week and picking out what we're going to do for an hour or so. And sometimes a dance party is selected. Sometimes it's karaoke. I will say I'm watching a lot more American Ninja or whatever that show is with athletes. I, I know much more about that show than I ever thought I would. <laughs> uh, and that's fine, right? And, and that's part of it too, is that um, this, again, sort of adds to the ritual that dad has to sing karaoke or 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 watch the show or whatever it is. That's, you know, that's part of the memory, so. Now, Kathy Entwistle, the premier wealth manager at Morgan Stanley that you are, tell us something embarrassing. <laughs> you have grown kids and, <laughs> and they've been with you. And one, uh, one of the kids who's, who's uh, under your roof is a chef. So, uh, so you've uh, lost a lot of weight during COVID, I'm sure. Oh, sure. How, <laughs> what, rit what rituals have you woven into the Entwistle family fabric? Um, a few and a few that align with Dan's as well, but I would say one is having um, young adults in the house again. So age range from 25 to 30, four of them. Um, there was a lot of uh, the, the TikTok dancing or whatever that was, you know, sort of. So I, you know, we talk about the crazy dance parties. I did a few TikToks with them and I thought I was super cool and the fun mom, even though it was, you know, whatever. <laughs> Very old fun mom. Um, so, but uh, so they did a lot of that. Our kids really, really um, embraced like the time together and made it more fun. I'll give them the credit as opposed to even me and my husband. Um, we loved having them home. Dinner table, we had dinner together every night and we went Which through, would not have been the norm, right? No, because none of our kids live at home anymore. So it would just yep. be me and my husband and we were always eating two separate meals because he likes one type of food and, and I, I, I like another. So we're, either, we're trying to eat together, but it's not like that kind of um, a cooking and gathering and sitting and discussing. And I would say it was like a, a little bit of the reprieve because we would do this conversation where we'd say like, Jim, what was your best thing that happened today? And what was your hardest thing that happened today? 
So we, we went through actually the good, the bad and the ugly. And, you know, just to really understand and appreciate what each other's day was like, um, did a lot of outdoor walking, biking, you know, just sort of trying to ground ourselves throughout the whole process um, as, a, as a family. Um, we do have conversations about gratitude and giving. And, you know, there were a lot of things that we did as a family for others that we felt were in a worse position than, than we were, you know, meaning um, so many people you know, for months, uh, so many people who, you know, your, your regular person who cuts your hair. I know that you, you don't have anyone that needs to do that, Jim, but for the rest of us, <laughs> I'm just teasing. Yeah, and, I resemble you know, that remark. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we reached out to um, our people that, you know, we interact with on a regular basis that we, we know we're, we're hurting. And, we tried to support them financially and, and other ways, even though they weren't able to work, we tried to like do things like that. And we had conversations as a family about that and why it was important to do that. So things like that, I would say, have been very helpful. And even adult young children, my 25 year olds, mom, you know, I'm supposed to be in the city. I'm supposed to be going out and meeting people and having fun. And, you know, it's just really hard or she wanted to be back in the office and nobody else in her office wanted to be in. So they kept it closed. But, and it's just a matter of trying to change your mindset. And also my son, which Dan, you might appreciate this. Um, he was telling us a story about, I guess a, a famous, um, uh, somebody famous like in the army or something that was overseas and was captured and he survived and he was one of the few to survive. And the reason why he survived is because everybody else thought they would get out of it very quickly. And he took a much longer term view and prepared for that. And that was really helpful. And so we tried to do that too. And mm -hmm. um, fortunately that, that was helpful too. Carol is, uh, as Juliet uh, mentioned uh, in getting us going here today, there's a really serious uh, element of this too, in addition to the social family consequences. And that is in an area where you're an expert. Your career is nothing short of amazing in terms of your running UNICEF and now executive director of Walton Family Foundation. And I know they have a real focus on K through 12 education. Uh, lots of kids aren't getting educated at all right now. Uh, we pat ourselves on the back in the media. We see mayors saying, oh, we've shifted dramatically. But they're ignoring the fact that a third of the kids don't have it to their connectivity. And we thought that technology was going to bridge the great divide. And for a computer, the divide is actually widening, isn't it? There's, I think, a couple of component pieces, you know, to all of this. So there is the digital divide, but there is more than a digital divide because it's not just about a school day. It's about a learning day and the totality of that day. And, you know, when we talk about like the psychosocial impact of what's happening for kids right now. So first of all, we do know that at least 30% are not learning. They're, they're absent from the learning process. In Seattle, I think it was just reported 50% of the kids who had access though, didn't ever log on. So, and wow. there was another study that was just shown that of the kids who did log on, there's a 26% higher failure rate amongst kids who never failed before because they, we are not adept yet at even knowing how to teach using this equipment. But even when we get past all of that, School represents more than just the academics. School is the place that the child who wears the same outfit every day for four or five days, somebody notices, or the child who has bruises on them, somebody notices, or the child who is usually very vociferous and is quiet, somebody notices. And there are, it can be the cafeteria woman, it can be the hall monitor, the guidance counselor, the teacher, but people know these children and they are resources to them. And now suddenly there is a child without any of that. And most often that child has less adult supervision at home as well. And so normalcy is gone, learning is gone, support, and then the resource for saving is gone. You know, there was one teacher who I was really struck by and I wish I could remember her name. She started office hours saying to kids, I will be on Zoom these hours if you have a question. And the most amazing thing happened, her class was logging on and doing homework, but not 
even talking to her. They just wanted an adult in the room. And we have to remember that. When I think in terms of the other piece of it too is all of us, so let's just talk about the child who's very fortunate and he's got some support at home. But as parents, we're going through this. And these children, many of them have moved because parents are fleeing cities. Many of them are experiencing an illness in the family or a loss in the family. Many of them are also experiencing an economic loss in the family. So what you could do last week, you can't do anymore or those ballet lessons went away, um, th that's gone. So there is so much. And I remember after the, the big storms in Houston, being in a first grade class after the kids came back to school and it rained and a whole bunch of first graders immediately went under their desks because for them, the rainstorm was a hurricane coming again. And I, I say that because I don't think we will know for a very long time really what our children think, how this is impacting them. I remember after 9-11, one of my kids was, was young at the time and I have same young adults home again. So it's been an interesting time and we are all cooking together. That has been fun. Um, and, but I remember him saying to me about three weeks later, mom, what, what floor is your office on? And he was, must've been about six years old at the time. And I told him, and, and this was like out of context to question one day. And he said to me, well, if you had to jump, could you jump? And I realized for three weeks, this is what he was thinking about. Yeah. And so, you know, we're asking our kids to be socially distant, but we have to be emotionally present. That's really my main message. You know, and that means we can't wait for them to come to us and say, I'm not handling this, even with our young adults. We have to ask those questions. We have to pay attention. You know, we have to zoom in and not on a screen. And, and we have to also, I think, you know, the whole idea we're talking about embracing traditions, not just new ones, but you know, like Thanksgiving time, we usually have a big table of people. Well, we didn't this year, but one of my kids made this styrofoam turkey that always went in the middle of the table. I mean, we embarrassed the hell out of him. It's my 25 year old. So we put it out every year. So even though it was just the four of us, we put it out this year. Out came the turkey. <laughs> out came the turkey. You know, it's important to do those things as well. I love what you said. Uh, Jim, you have to coin that somewhere or like, you know, mark that. It's socially distant, but emotionally present. Is emotionally present. Yep. And it's really critical right now. Well, I think Our we kids... made a mistake of mis, mis de defining that as, as social distancing. It was wrong from the get-go. It was physical distancing, not social distancing. Yeah, physical distance. Mm -hmm. But but, I, but emotionally present because we have not trained in, and with young adults, you know, Kathleen, I'm struck by, I'm sure you are too. We're not usually in their lives in the way we are right now. Yeah. And we, they're not- How will they ever recover yet. from that? I know, I, believe me, I have four sons, three sons, excuse me. They'll be very happy when mom's off their back. But, um, you know, so it is about the dance parties, but in our house, it's it's mom now watches Sunday football, which I never did. Before. But, um, you know, it, it is about asking the right questions and being respectful also of, of when you got to stop asking because they're grown ups. And, it, and it's a balance. And it, and it is even sitting down with the young adults, I think, and saying to them, I'm not used to this. I'm under stress, too. You know, we're, we're not used to all living together. Maybe we should talk about how we want to do that. You know, you negotiated mm -hmm. with your spouse when you moved in together, you know, but you never negotiated with your kids. You, you, you directed your kids, but now you've just moved in as roommates. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think that's a, yeah. that's a different construct. We got to treat it differently. It seems what's different now than a few months ago is that, uh, well, we certainly have a few or several very tough months ahead. The virus is spreading quickly, but the difference now that in the spring, in the spring, Juliet and I were talking about this recently, our fears were very primal. Juliet, you were living in Brooklyn at the time, separated from your, your family by an ocean. Uh, we were concerned about, would we be able to get food? Uh, what, would the, what would be going on in the streets? If we got sick, would we have access to healthcare? Would there be a ventilator? We had all of those primal concerns. And now the difference is, the miracle of science that's occurring before us is, is nothing short of amazing. Dr. Chloe, as we focus on the fact that there is light at the end of the tunnel, surely dark and troubling days between now and then, but now we can see the impact of therapeutics 
and the vaccines, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And, and, and you've done, you're, you're like a voice in my head about good counseling. You always frame it in such a way that I, even I can remember it. But you were talking recently about the fact that as kids miss this social interactivity time, they've unlearned the, the signals of social acceptance. Right, And, and you have a guide, right, as parents to, to help them and to, uh, to help them understand and help us determine whether or not they're getting the signals for social acceptance. Right. You know, um, it's, it's true, Jim. I, I think that there's been a spike in social anxiety from all of us, from children as well, just as we've been out of practice. You know, we talked about being in high school. Many of us may feel almost like we are back in high school when we're, you know, around groups of people again. Um, and, and one simple way that we can actually, you know, mitigate that tendency towards social anxiety is to give ourselves a little cognitive challenge of trying to find five signs of social acceptance whenever we walk into a room. And those could be things as simple as eye contact, someone smiling at you, someone, you know, kind of waving or, or just anything at all. And really what you're doing then is you are forcing your attention, your powers of attention, your executive lobe, you're putting that attention on signs of acceptance rather than on signs of anxiety. Because you're absolutely right, Jim, that when all of this started, we literally had, um, you know, just fears of millions and millions of deaths and, you know, all kinds of things. And we all shut ourselves into our homes. And it's also important, just as you said, to really recognize that although we're not out of the woods and we still have issues, that we're really not dealing with the same type of problem that we thought we were when we all shut ourselves into our homes, you know, back in March. Um, and, and Carol, I, I just wanted to also, you know, express, I love what you said um, about wanting to be able to be emotionally present, even if we are physically distant. Um, in fact, this is a really important opportunity for parents to model for their children, how to deal with adversity, and how to deal with not knowing the answer to certain situations. Um, when I was in training in school, I did some research working with families that were homeless. And interestingly enough, the families that were homeless actually in many cases displayed higher levels of family closeness and positive family relationships than families that were quite wealthy. And the reason that researchers kind of speculated around this was that these families had a need to rely on each other in a really deep way. Um, and so sometimes when things do get really tough, um, it actually you know, creates, not that we would wish for this need, but the fact is, is that because of the need, we can embrace the opportunity to actually rely on each other and model for our children, exactly as you said, Carol, how to say, yeah, you know what, I'm really, I'm really grappling with this. And I just you know, don't feel like I have all the answers either. And, and we don't have to pretend like everything's okay, but then also modeling for the kids that we can acknowledge this, that it is hard, but we also don't have to dwell on it either. So after we've had a moment to kind of talk about it and acknowledge it, then absolutely to say, okay, well, what other things, you know, could we do? And I, I love some of the rituals that people have been sharing and, um, you know, just to throw one more option into the mix. Um, one of the things that uh, clients in my office have been really enjoying is like, if you go to Amazon and you punch in like conversation cards, there's those little table talk type cards because some of us find ourselves almost a little bit talked out, right? After having been cooped up together for so long. Um, so those, you know, another fun ritual can just be to do a couple of the conversation cards every now and then. So Chloe, another how would you do that long distance? You know, how, how can we, you know, if, we, if we're not all in the same household, you know, one of the things I just wrote down after Carol's comments there was, I'm going to suggest to my kids that we do a rotation, uh, three grown kids and six grandkids, that we do a rotation where we have a Zoom dinner with a different family each night. Uh, and, and when I was reading some of your work, uh, Dan, I, uh, a note I made was, you know, how do I impose on my uh my, my siblings' kids who are older to 
adopt one of the other next generation and be the aunt or the uncle that calls them about how they're doing in history. And I took that from some of the things that you were saying, Chloe, uh, about how we can call on other people. You were saying vocabulary mattered so much. So don't ask how Zoom going. Get into yeah, um, I'm so I'm sorry. I think there was a little delay. I didn't mean to speak over you. Um, did you ask me to share about um, about that that idea about how, how, how to talk to kids? How, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. How about vocabulary matters? Yeah, the vocabulary does matter. Um, so when and and this I think is also interesting with with Dan's research too about memory um, and and the language and the labels that we have for things and also the way that we as either parents or you know extended family members that are trying to support these kids um, the things that we ask about are what's telling that child what is the salient feature of this experience that adults are paying attention and therefore I should be paying attention to. And so if we are always saying, oh my gosh, how's remote learning? And like, I know we're coming from a good place when we do that, we're trying to make sure the child knows that we're empathizing with them and thinking about them and recognizing that that's a challenge. And I'm not saying don't ask about it, but we also want to make sure that we don't give the idea that we're myopically focused on the fact that it is remote. So we also want to say things like, you know, what is your favorite subject this year? Or, you know, um, have you thought about like, you know, college? I know it might seem like, you know, say that a junior in high school and, you know, what's, what's going on with college or, you know, um, how are you staying in touch with any of your, you know, friends this year? And, you know, what's even what are the challenging parts of school? Or, you know, I'd love to read one of your essays. I haven't read an essay, you know, from a high school student in a while, and your mom says you're doing great. I'd love to see maybe I could learn something, you know, ask them to send you, um, you know, one of their essays or something like that. Um, I just, I think that there's a lot of opportunities here um, for us to think creatively about how we are reaching out to those kids. And, um, you know, Carol, again, I just, I love what you're saying about um, parents needing to also be able to acknowledge that some of this stuff is hard for them too sometimes. And I just wanted to underline also that by us being vulnerable and acknowledging some of our own stressors with this too, we're actually also teaching our kids about empathy. So a lot of times I work with parents that think that the best way to support their kids is, you know, to just act like they're totally fine because they say, I don't want to burden my child with my stress. And it's true. You don't want to try and turn your child into your therapist. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, we, we actually teach our children children empathy and we teach them that they are a valuable person who can be a resource to somebody under stress by letting them know like wow you know I have to tell you it felt pretty good to talk to you today you know thanks for letting me share with you but you also want to of course let them know you know that that you've got it together that you're okay um, but at the same time that that you can be open with them but yes Jim definitely when it comes to talking to kids about school um, I would say like maybe every I would go for almost like a five to one ratio, like ask for, you know, five other topics and then talk about the remote aspect if they want to. And, you know, certainly if they bring it up, it's fine to talk about it, but it's also possible that sometimes they might bring it up because again, they've gotten the idea that that's the topic that the adults care about or that that's the one that's the most emotionally resonant. And so bringing it up feels like a shortcut to intimacy and closeness. And so again, it's fine to ask about it. And especially if they bring it up, you don't wanna seem like you're batting away the topic, but if you, I would encourage everyone who does have kids in their life that they wanna support to just take a minute and list, you know, what are five things that I could specifically ask, you know, that particular child about um, so that you have some good topics front of mind that you can help shape their memories about what's important. Carol, what were you, you going to Speaking of five things, uh, go ahead, Julia. Yeah, I, I just wanted to go back to Carol because I know you had something to add to-, to talk Well, I was just going to say, you know, and I, I love what you just were saying, Chloe, so much. Um, 
But one of the one of my friends, I take no credit for this because it wasn't something I did, but she did. She was talking about the fact that they have a huge extended family and they usually do get together for the holidays and they were decided they would do their Zoom dinner. But with that many people, it gets very chaotic. And so one of the uh, her cousins found an app and I don't know the app or I would share it, but did a family Jeopardy game where all of the questions had to do with members of the family. And it was great because one, and when my kids heard about it, one of their comments was, well, remember when we were little and there would be these huge parties. That's how we know what Uncle Joe is like. And that's what we know how so-and-so is like. And then this generation, my grandchildren are missing those stories this year. They're not getting that. And so by doing this, first of all, it focused their Zoom. She said it was so much fun. They played for an hour and it was the best Zoom she's had the whole time. That sounds great. Now, but you also did an article in the USA Today, uh, Carol, about the, uh, the five ways to help kids cope with uh, the COVID pandemic. Well, yeah, and most of them, I think, have been said, you know, as I said, you want to pay attention. You also want to kind of embrace the power of one, you know, helping your children to understand that even though life is different, it doesn't stop them from being impactful, that they still have power. They could be writing letters if they're old enough, they can they could vote, they could be engaged in the debates that are taking place. They could be a voice for something, they could volunteer somewhere because that is part of what I think is really critical to, to student and young people development anyway. But you also wanna reward hope. You know, Juliet, you were talking about, and I can't think of the soldier's name. He was the guy who was held in captivity for seven years in Vietnam. And it is his theory, um, I think actually, sorry, Kathleen, you mentioned it. He had a theory of the balance. Yeah. So it was important for you to live in the moment, to acknowledge it's tough, but at the same time to have that hope and to balance the two. And that they found in all of the research, if you only have one or the other, you don't survive. You have to be able to balance right. both. And those that said, I'll be home by Christmas failed because they didn't get home by Christmas. So, you know, having real, some realistic hope. And I think that we need to reward hope with our kids. You know, we need to help them understand that they can still be hopeful and acknowledge it as it happens. And how do we do that? Uh, uh, how do we teach our kids, as Carol says, to be other directed, to learn the benefits of, of uh, doing for others and how that endures to our own uh, good feelings? Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is another instance of where we uh, we need to be creative given the current situation that we had mechanisms pre pandemic by which we did that those have now gotten disrupted and so we need to start thinking of other ways of uh, expressing those values. So I was thinking when when Carol was talking about ways of uh, being involved, a lot of which was sort of civic in, engagement, it can also be very small and very local. And even if you're isolated, even if you're quarantined, you still have neighbors um, who uh, and you've still got, you know, people who are coming to your house and, and saving you the, the postal service is coming and, and bringing you things and, and grocery delivery and all that. Um, and so this is one way we've encouraged our kids to sort of get outside of our own heads, our family, um, uh, think beyond our own family, to um, you know reach out to those people in in small ways, and uh, you know whether it's baking them cookies or writing them a note or checking in with neighbors or something like that. So I think there um, there there are opportunities in the pandemic for that. Dan, what just, advice sorry. would you? Uh, sorry, Chloe, go on. No, I just wanted to say, I, I think that is so important about volunteering. It does help us to keep uh, challenges in perspective, but it also does what we call increasing your feelings of self-efficacy and it decreases your sense of helplessness. And we do have to be careful with all of this, you know, being shut in. There's something in psychology called behavioral activation, which is when we take on the behaviors of certain, you know, types 
then we can almost take on that mentality. And so if I tell you about a person who stays shut in and distant from other people, then you almost start thinking about someone who could be depressed, right? And so we want to counteract that by, you know, doing things like volunteering again, because it not only helps keep those problems in perspective, uh, but it does also um, increase self-efficacy and decrease helplessness. Self-efficacy and helplessness are central to depression. So that would be important to, to try to decrease them. And I just wanted to also say, uh, Carol, you know, as you mentioned, holding hope, I was thinking about that too, when you were speaking about that, you know, very brave uh, soldier that was captured, um, that there's something in psychology called defensive pessimism. And a certain degree of defensive pessimism is actually helpful. So his defensive pessimism was when he said, you know what, I'm not sure we're going to be out of here by Christmas, I better prepare, you know, for, for not being but as you said, Carol, if we go too far with it, if we don't also make room for an awareness of the positives or be open to some silver linings, not again in his situation, unfortunately, I'm sure that would be very difficult, but I hope for all of us in our quarantine situations that we can focus on some silver linings and things like that and hold on to our sense of hope so that our defensive pessimism doesn't become overblown. Because in small doses, again, it's actually important. We don't want to just be some kind of a Pollyanna and be constantly setting ourselves up for total disappointment. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to go too far with it. Um, and also just on that topic of volunteering, and you know, it can bring families closer. And um, I wanted to just also share that on my website, I do have a place where I've made a whole list of online volunteer opportunities. So if people are interested in doing online volunteering, um, if it's okay, I'll just chat a link into the chat so people can see a whole list of those opportunities. Yeah, and, and also what Dan said in terms of little acts of kindness too, like I, I can tell you because I work for the Walton family, we were co very conscious of how some of the Walmart employees were feeling because Walmart kept the stores open and they were providing a critical need service, you know, for communities. And somebody started just amongst us, you know, when you go into Walmart and you do your shopping, thank the salesperson for being there. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, I don't know how they felt, but I can tell you how I felt, okay? You know, when you, and I got my kids doing it then, you know, and when they would say thank you and this person, they would just say thank you for showing up for work today and for being here so that I could get my groceries. And it was, it lightened everybody's day. So it is sometimes just something small that makes mm -hmm. the difference. Yeah. There's a, several questions um, around anxiety, both parents and kids. And I'm interested in what, what advice would you give for, for those parents that have got young kids at home that are working, trying to keep the house together, trying to homeschool their kids and be emotionally present, but are, are genuinely feeling anxious. What advice would you give to those parents? And then there's a follow on on question around middle school age children who are particularly feeling ang anxious for the first time. Um, what kind of language should be we be using and behaviors should we be using with them? Dan, do you want to take that one? Uh, I'll, I'll speak to children and then I'll, I'll maybe let Chloe talk about uh, adults. How's that? Because um, I've been thinking about school age children and anxiety a lot recently because I've been hearing about um, a lot of instances of that from from teachers. And as Chloe, I think, mentioned earlier, there's almost no doubt that anxiety is really spiking. Hiking. Um, this is something that I think parents can really help with. Um, parents can uh, help both, uh, well, in two ways. First, um, locate what the source of anxiety is in the child. What is it that they're really anxious about? It is eminently possible that they're anxious about something uh, that you are really going to be able to be reassuring about in a very factual way. And let them know. Listen, you know, we are. It, it's true that the situation is dire, but we're being really safe, and you know, we're not in immediate danger. That sort of thing. Um, they may be anxious about the state of the world more generally, um, and they may really benefit from just being able to talk with you about that, um, and uh, not hold it all in, and and have someone uh, that they trust who they're they're able to talk with about it. 
Um, and then finally, they may be anxious about their situation as it relates to school, as it relates to their social situation and um, uh, their relationship with their friends. And there you may be able to uh, do some effective troubleshooting in figuring out what is it that you used to have pre-pandemic that you don't have anymore. Um, maybe it was maybe it was feeling of efficacy and feeling like I was just getting to the point where maybe they wouldn't be able to articulate it this uh, uh, eloquently maybe, but you know, I was just getting to the point where I was independent and you were fine with me riding my bicycle downtown with my friends. And now all of a sudden that's been taken away from me. Um, and so you may be able to uh, help them think that through and then find some other way that that psychological need can be satisfied in a way that is uh, safe and, and pandemic appropriate. So and, the big thing one, is to start, start yeah, with talking to them. That's helpful, Dan. Well, I mean, one of the viewers is saying, you know, that their child is anxious about dying because she had a family member that died. Yes. Um, I, how do you deal with that? Right. Um, well, it depends. It does depend a little bit on the circumstances, doesn't it? But I mean, it, 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 you can be empathic. And of course, that's the first response is to be empathic about how she's, how she's feeling and, and reacting in, in this empathic way herself. Uh, while at the same time being reassuring about her own state of health and uh, sort of try and get her on a, a, a better mental path about uh, about her own and and her family's uh, status. Yeah. Okay. Um, Chloe, you, I, Chloe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Dr. Chloe, you have a a book coming out maybe in March or so. As a matter of fact, I do. It, <laughs> <laughs> Where did I see? I thought that was an angel on your shoulder. <laughs> but uh, one of the, one of the things I've read from you over time is. Uh, helping people understand that anxiety is natural and it's a, a, and it creates energy and the energy is most often negative but you teach people in, in your writing and I would suspect in your new book about how to take that that energy and turn it into a positive energy exactly thank you Jim so the healthy function of anxiety is to stimulate preparatory behaviors Right? I'll just say that again, because I think it's just so important. The healthy function of anxiety is to stimulate preparatory behaviors. So we actually don't want to get rid of anxiety. Um, it's really important that we listen to it, right? And ask ourselves, you know, what is that anxiety trying to tell me? So to that parent who is noticing that they are feeling a lot of anxiety, um, we don't actually want to get rid of it per se, as much as we want to address it. So I, I hear from that parent's question that, you know, you're putting a lot of effort into taking care of your kids, which is wonderful. Uh, I, you know, kind of gather that you're putting a lot of effort into trying to take care of things at your job. I imagine you're also putting effort into trying to be emotionally supportive to your spouse. The question is, who is taking care of you? And maybe that anxiety is the healthy signal, like the engine light that pops on in the car to tell us when we time to get an oil change. Maybe that anxiety is the healthy signal telling you that it's time to make sure that you are actually carving out some time to rejuvenate yourself. Um, so that could mean um, just to offer some practical ideas. I, I, I hope that you, we all have ideas of how to rejuvenate ourselves, but I know sometimes, especially when we get into that anxiety funk, it can suddenly seem like, you know, what, what could we do? Um, and so one thing is to just really give yourself permission to relax. Some people feel like it's somehow really bad to be relaxed or happy during the pandemic, like that it would be inconsiderate of other people and the difficulties that people are having if you should, you know, find a moment of respite and relax and actually, you know, find things that you're enjoying. So I want to hereby give you permission to know that in fact, the better rested and balanced you are, the better resource, you know, you can be then for other people. Um, I would also encourage you to consider something like a massage. Um, so, I mean, obviously you can have a massage from somebody in a mask with, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, PPE and everything else, because there's something called skin hunger, where when our bodies are not touched, 
we don't do very well, right? I think we probably all have heard about the very sad studies even of, of babies in orphanages that were actually dying because they weren't being held enough. And so all of this physical distancing, I think is causing many of us to just have a, a sense of feeling alone, right? And so a massage is a great way to replenish your skin hunger. The Journal of the American Medical Association, in fact, published some research showing that cortisol levels dropped by about 30% after a 60 minute massage. I mean, that's pretty incredible, 30%. Um, so I would encourage you to consider something like that. Um, you know, also certainly exercise, or if you've always wanted to try a meditation practice or those conversation cards I mentioned can be a fun way too to just connect with people without feeling like you have to do a lot of work to like keep the conversation going. And Jim, I know you asked me earlier, um, I don't think I answered it, you know, how can you adapt a game like that to Zoom? Um, very simple. The good news is we just send it out to different people. Uh, we just send that game, you know, the game is $8 a set usually. And so it's pretty easy that we can meet up on zoom. And I did put links to all those things in my, um, slash COVID, um, that I shared in the chat. Um, but one other thing to just consider is, um, and I may be biased because I'm a clinical psychologist, but it's always good to know that therapy is available that there's no shame, there's nothing wrong with it. If there were ever a time to acknowledge that you're under stress, um, you know, as somebody, I, I, you know, I work exclusively with high functioning people. And one of the things that it can be hard, ironically, for high functioning people to do is, you know, to, to think about going to counseling because they feel like, you know, like, oh, gee, is there something wrong with me? The, the truth is, is that it's actually the highest functioning thing that you can do to realize, you know, when that engine light is on and to make sure that you get some support, you know, there's like, there's talk space and there's online therapy. And I wrote an article on US News and World Report also about how to choose an online therapist because I know it can be a little bit daunting for people. But I would just say that when you detect that little sense of anxiety, instead of getting anxious about the anxiety and letting it snowball and thinking, oh no, I'm anxious, oh my God, to instead say, actually congratulate yourself for realizing it, for registering it. And then ask yourself, you know, where is this coming from? You know, what is the stress? How can I support myself? That's such just, great. Uh, because we do, and I just want to also in closing remind you, thank you. That one more point just to share again is that that is actually excellent modeling for your kids as well. So that if you can say to the kids, you know what, I've been a little stressed lately. And so I, I'm just going to talk to somebody. I'm fine, but I'm just going to talk to somebody or I've had a lot of stress. I'm going to book a few massages this week just to kind of like bliss out a little bit. I think I need to chill out. And you know, when you can just kind of acknowledge that to your kids, it's actually good parenting. I'm hopeful that this uh, COVID, which is an accelerant to so many things, is an accelerant to what you just talked about, Dr. Chloe, which is the idea that therapy is a good thing and it's more accessible than ever, right? Talk space, uh, peer help groups like WISDO, uh, at Flowers we have we created connection communities. I, I think it's more available than ever and it's removed the, the three barriers to trial, which is stigma, cost, and access. And now it's all available and, and I think, uh, I think we'll look back at the time where, where proper counseling and therapy is made available and accepted during this accelerant of COVID. Carol, uh, uh, what, what are you gonna take away from our discussion today? Uh, uh, I have a couple of new ones here. I'm suffering from skin hunger big time. Uh, I, I have, I, I'm gonna I'm going uh, tap other people to be godparents of history and science of my grandkids. Kathy, what, do you, what are your takeaways? Well, first of all, I'm right there with the skincare or whatever that was. The massages sound like a great idea. I loved what um, Dr. Chloe said about realizing it's like the emergency light in your car saying something needs to be addressed. Like, I think that's a great perspective and it's a mind shift and help. So I love that. Um, I love what, um, uh, what, we, what we said about, um, what was the, uh, Carol uh, said um, emotionally present about yeah emotionally present thank you Juliet the emotionally present and then the last piece about um, I just love the 
the concept about um, gratitude uh, with your family, spending time. And, and what we haven't done is given each person a chance to pick something to do. And I think that's also a great idea. And, and, and the idea that our memories can shift our perception. I think that sometimes that helps us you know, move forward in the world because we think so so differently of like the experience that we had in the past. So all of that I think is is super helpful. Carol, for all those parents who are juggling all these activities out there, not knowing when school is going to be in, when it's not, is there sports, isn't there? What, 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 besides sitting with your feet up on the coffee table, watching football with the boys on Sunday afternoon, what other counsel do you have for these young parents who we all work with? Uh, some are on this call with us. How do they, how do they balance this when they have a three-year-old home and, uh, and he's not getting that social interaction? that, that uh, Juliet would like for him? What, what, what thoughts do you have I, for I us? think a couple of thoughts there. You know, one is to remember as parents, we never think we do enough and we never think that we're as good as some other parents are at the parenting game. And I think, you know, one of the gifts, I always say one of the gifts of being over 60 now is you kind of come to terms with who you are and you, and you give yourself permission and forgive yourself for all the mistakes you've made. And it's kind of a very freeing moment. And I only wish I could have had it in my 20s or 30s when my kids were young. And, you know, and I wondered, why didn't I have a book that really taught me how to do this? And, and am I doing it right or wrong? And, and you used the term a minute ago, Jim, the accelerant. And this is not only an accelerant for good, it is an accelerant on a lot of the things that we normally cope with. I saw in the chat, somebody asked about, um, you know, is there something in particular for the LBGQ community? Is there a, you know, th that anything that would be normal stresses as parents, there's an accelerant right now. We have more time to focus on what we're not doing right. So all of these things that we've been talking about to give to our kids, we got to give to ourselves too you know, forgive yourself. You're not going to get it 100% right. Your kid isn't going to have a teacher who has 20 years experience of teaching online. And just because your child's not learning online doesn't mean your child can't learn. Think about what other experiences, mm -hmm. as I said, think about a learning day, not a school day. Because in a normal world, when we don't have COVID, they have a learning day. They go to baseball, yeah. they go to dance class, they play in the park, they learn from their friends. So understand learning happens. And then the other thing that someone said to me recently that I, I haven't come to terms with yet, but I'm noodling on still. We think of the World War II generation as the greatest generation and how these people grew up, you know, the children of, of World War II and exceeded every generation before them with success. They had learning gaps. They were out of school for great periods of time. And they found a way to appreciate learning afterwards in a very different way and they found great success. So, you know, breathe a moment and, and remind yourself that it is a new normal. When, you know, the path to success is going to be different, but we're going to find it and we're going to find it together. Dan, I was struck by something you said and I wrote it down. And it's, it's a theme that you've heard from us uh, over these shows. You talked about uh, the baked goods, the whole product of, of your wife and one or two or three of your, four of your kids working together to, to bake something, to give it to somebody else. It unlocks the power that we each have. And if we only taught our kids that they have this unbelievable power, they have the power to change how someone feels in very deep and meaningful ways. And it could be something as simple as baking a banana nut bread and bringing it to the lady down the hall and with a note saying how much you love having her as a neighbor and how you look forward to seeing her in the hallway every day. That'll change that lady's day for sure, maybe a week, maybe a month, but you're gonna change how she feels. It could be a note. It could be a note that your kids make that they give to the, uh, to the uh, UPS man who gets their packages up to their door all the time you're going to change his day when he opens up that handwritten note and you have a nice note in there with using his name about how much they look forward to waiting to him every day and how they appreciate it. He always waves back, even if they see him a few blocks away. We all have that power. If we just now teach our kids the power they have to change how daddy feels, to change how your sister feels, who you've been picking on all day. And I, when you said that, it just rang bells in my head, Dan. Thank you for for sharing that with us. Juliet? 
I think, um, I mean, it's it, it's left me with so many thoughts. And, and, um, and Carol, I love your positivity, first of all. And, and, and Chloe and Dan, I, I love your practical advice for parents, so many of which are suffering right now. And I think so many kids are. That it's, it, there's some broader macro questions that I think going to the accelerant point around you know, we're, do, do we need to think about the edu the curriculum and the education? And I know, Carol, you, you mentioned this in our call the other day, but <clears throat> are we, is what we're teaching through the curriculum the right things to be teaching our kids now? Uh, and actually, do we need to really rethink that? And, and how will this, this time accelerate some of those systemic things that, that are in place um, that, that maybe haven't changed since the Industrial Revolution? Um, I, I think this is um, such a helpful conversation to be having right now, um, and we will continue it. <clears throat> I think we're excited to bring in a monthly column around this, um, which I think Chloe is going to be helping us with. And we will cover a lot of the questions that we haven't got to today, because there's been so many that have come through from the community that, that we haven't um, got to. But thank you, everyone, so much, because it was such an engaged group. Um, and uh, I, I think... Um, it's such a, a important conversation that we're having. So thank you all. And, and I just want to say, um, Chloe, Carol, Kathy, Daniel and Jim, thank you for, for being part of this conversation. And, and a special thank you to Kathy um, at, at Morgan Stanley and 1-800-Flowers for being our partner for this series. And, and also thanks to Brian and Julie and Meredith and the team at Flowers for supporting this session. Um, but most importantly, thanks to everyone that joined us today and, and for your great questions. And um, and know that being anxious is okay. That's the one thing that I'm going to take away. Um, and uh, I also wanted to invite you all to join us next week for a special event of the year that we're having, which is the final Next Normal series of 2020, which we're doing uh, with, with Kathy again at, at Thursday at the later time of 6 p.m. Eastern time, where we'll be talking about why the time is now for women. And we've got some great special guests, Andrea Klein, Klein Thomas, Kate Luzio, and Shelley Zalis, uh, CEO of the Female Quotient. So um, join us. It will be a combination of great conversation and also a special invite to virtually network over, over a drink. So uh, we'd love to see you there. Look out for that invite. And albeit this year will be different, we wish you a restful holiday season and hope to see you uh, next week and, and obviously early in the new year. And in the meantime, be kind to yourself and others. Look after yourself, stay healthy, safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Thanks.